if you if you are as cold as I am, it's okay if you want to stand up and walk around. Maybe we should do some exercise, you know, some jumping jacks or so I'm I am freezing. I don't know what it is today. It's just really, really cold. So how many of you were here for my keynote two days ago? Good. So I can refer to that and if any of you believe in God, would you offer up a little prayer for me so that I hope my PowerPoint won't crash? <laughs> I don't know what else to do. I have checked it. I have run my Bit Defender. I have downloaded new versions of Windows. I have done everything I can think of over the last couple of days. It seems to be working now, but you never know. And it never hurts to have God on your side. Absolutely. So I'm counting on all the prayers of the people in this group. So I'm Linda Rising. I'm an independent consultant. I live near Nashville, Tennessee in the United States. And I have been thinking about and worrying about and writing about organizational change for about 25 years. So that's a third of my lifetime. And with my very good friend and co-author, Mary Lynn Manns, have written a couple of books. And I'm going to be talking today about some general myths. So do you understand the word myth? I think India has lots of myths, don't you? A good story? We know the power of stories. Myths about organizational change. And then we're going to look at some patterns that could possibly address those myths. So this is a rather high-level talk, and I know that there'll be implementation questions. I hope we'll fit this all in 45 minutes. And as most of you already know, I give away my slides. So if you want to send me some email, you have my email address, linda at lindarising.org, and I will be happy to send you the, these slides or the keynote or anything else that you find online. I'll be happy to send you the PowerPoint and then you, <laughs> you weren't praying hard enough. Okay, so you can give the presentation. So let's have a look. I'm assuming that you know what a pattern is. Yes? Okay, design patterns came about in the mid-1990s. And we were talking then about a way of writing a solution to a problem in a context, and then we were going to give it a name. And once we had the name for a pattern, we could talk about that solution, that problem, that context, by just using the name. And that gave us really a vocabulary. We called it a pattern language, but it's a vocabulary for talking about a particular domain. If it was the Gang of Four design patterns, we'd be talking about design. The patterns we're going to talk about today have to do with organizational change. So we can use the name, and what we're talking about is a particular solution to a problem in a given context. And if the name is a good one, then you don't really need a lot of explanation. You understand intuitively a little bit about all of those elements, what the problem is, and what the solution provides for that context. So that's the power of patterns. It gives you a little language, and with that language you can talk about the domain at a pretty high level. <clears throat> you can have a design discussion. You can have a discussion about organizational change just using the names of the patterns. It's very powerful. So the first book that Mary Lynn and I wrote is called Fearless Change. It took us 10 years. When I began writing that book, I would have called myself a technical person. I have a PhD in computer science. I would have called myself a designer. What got me interested in patterns was the Gang of Four book, the Design Patterns book. But by the time we finished that book, I had learned a lot about fields that I had no knowledge of, no understanding of. Furthermore, I didn't even think they were important. I discovered the field of social psychology. Now, I know what psychology is, and I had had one class 
in psychology. But I didn't understand that there's a different field of psychology that looks at groups, group behavior. Psychology typically focuses on individuals, how individuals respond, experiment on individuals. Social psychology, the psychology of groups, is very different. And it talks about how groups of people behave. And that's exactly what we need if we're going to talk about organizational change. What is it that social psychology has learned as a science to help us understand how groups of people make decisions? That was something I didn't even realize was a field or a domain of science. And then the field of influence. I remember getting feedback on some of these early patterns, and someone said, you know why these work? This particular pattern works because it's based on, or it sits on, an influence strategy. Now, to me, the word influence meant something, well, that's what marketing people, business people, they use influence, politicians, use influence. And I thought it was underhanded and deceptive, and I wasn't really sure that I wanted to have anything to do with it. And after I began to look at it and study it, I realized that I had been handicapped by not knowing more about influence, because influence studies how you move people in a given direction. And if you don't understand that, then you have only one fallback position, which as a technical person is what I had always used all my life, which is logic. Just explain it to them. Just tell them the benefits of your idea, and if they're smart people, well then they'll do it. And then finally, evolutionary biology says we behave a certain way because we have evolved over, over tens of thousands of years to have a particular response to something in the environment, and there is nothing we can do about that because it is hardwired. At some point it meant survival, our ancestors had it, they produced us, ultimately. So in writing that first book, I learned much more than I anticipated about how people behave in groups, and that's how this first book was able to produce so many effective patterns. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of my journey, because I believed certain things about people that really turned out to not be true, and then in discovering what science can provide, as information for a better understanding of group behavior, the patterns that evolve out of that understanding. So this is a quote from Jeff Patton. We heard his wonderful keynote yesterday. We were on the stage together at one point, and he said, you're not here to build software, you're here to change the world. So whether you're trying to in do some kind of organizational change effort or not, what you do every day has as its heart or the intent to change the world. So even if you think you're not an organizational change agent, you do need an understanding of the patterns because this is really what you are all about. So here's myth number one. Let's take a little poll. How many smart people in the room? Oh, come on. Three, three four, five smart people. Oh, come on. I'm smart. Yeah, we are all smart. I know you're, you're smart because you're here. There is clear evidence that you are a smart person. And you have a belief that because you're smart, that you are logical. Anybody? Sure. And so your decisions are made for rational. You can explain it. You know why you decided to come to this conference today or you decided to have a, a couple of cookies. Those were all conscious decisions and you decided those for some logical reason. You could even explain it. If somebody asked you, you could give a reason. 
So because we can give reasons for our decisions, we believe that we must have made those for logical reasons. So that is a myth. Not only are you not logical, none, that is zero, of your decisions are logical, but what you have been fundamentally doing when you try to change people, you believe that they must be smart and so therefore they make logical decisions. So therefore, if you just give them reasons, that will convince them. That's at the heart of the only tool in your toolbox. To convince others, just explain it to them. That's all you've got at this point, and you've been subscribing to a myth. We have already seen at this conference, even, several talks that have mentioned the wonderful book by Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. How many of you, the first question is, how many of you have heard of the book? How many of you bought the book? How many of you read the book? I know, it's a big book, and it's very difficult, and it's well written, but it's long. It's a slog, I would say. If you were able to get through it, you would learn an enormous amount about how you make decisions. And what's in the book is all of the evidence, the science behind what I just exploded that first myth by saying you're not logical. We are not. And for evidence, I'm going to point you to Kahneman's book, which I know you might buy, but you're not going to have the time to read. There's lots of other information on the web. If you don't want to read the whole book, there are many wonderful summaries of the book that will give you a little bit of an idea of what he's talking about. A much easier reference is anything by Dan Ariely, who's an Israeli behavioral economist, and the books that he's written about how we are not very good at rational thinking. This is my favorite, predictably irrational, and I think I saw a copy on the little book table out there, so you might be able to get a copy if there's one left. His books are more accessible, easier to read, they're not as comprehensive, but they're still good, the experiments are interesting, and the field of behavioral e economics right now is all about how poor we are at making decisions and how none of our decisions are based on rationality. So if that's the only tool you have in your toolbox, that's really limiting you. Subscribing to that myth is going to get in your way. So you need something else. So an example, at least in the United States, uh, are, is there an Indian stock market where you buy stocks? Good, okay. So here's the recommendation for stocks. Buy low, buy when the price is low, sell when the price is high. That's rational. And what do you do? And what do I do? And what do all of us do? When the price starts to go up, we think, ah, the stock market. Price is going up, I better buy some. So we buy when the price is going up. Now what happens when the price is coming down? We get scared and we think, I better sell it. It's not a logical decision at all. Watch in times of turbulence on the stock market and see what happens. We don't follow this rational advice. We go with fear and our gut reaction of saying, no, 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 it's going up, I better buy some. Oh no, the price is going down, I better sell. We do exactly the opposite. And if you start looking now, you might notice many other examples of how irrational we are at making decisions. Not you, of course, but other people. Other people so the patterns that we identified in fearless change have to do with not appealing to a rational argument, but instead looking at emotion. 
making an emotional connection. And the first pattern we always recommend is one called evangelist. Now, Mary Lynn lives in the South, and at the time we wrote the book, I was living in Arizona, and we tried to decide what the name of this pattern should be. The person who leads the change effort or who initiates it should have enthusiasm, should have passion, should care about it, should know about it, should perhaps even love it, fall in love with the idea. So I was working with a telecom company, and in Lucent, we used a term, corporate evangelist, meaning someone who is going to lead an effort around that particular idea. And I suggested the idea of evangelist. And Mary Lynn said, no, no, we can't use that word. You know what that means in the South? It means religion. It means a preacher standing in front of a crowd of people saying, yes, people, I will show you the way. So we debated, we finally left it as evangelists, and now as we look back on it, we realize that is the exact, perfect, wonderful name, because in the beginning, when you have an idea and you want to change your organization, you don't know. You often have no evidence. One of the things I talked about a couple of days ago is that we have no evidence for Agiles being successful in organization. All we have are stories. We have no science, no experiment. So especially in the beginning, if you want your organization to go Agile, whatever your idea is, you don't know. All you have is what's in your heart, what you believe. And it's that belief, that passion, that's what will drive the whole effort. So evangelist is exactly what you are. You are trying to convince people because you believe in something and you want them to believe in it too. You don't have any scientific experiments that show clearly your idea is a good one. So once you've taken on this role of evangelist with the idea of I'm not sure, but I believe in it. I believe it will help. I talked about small experiments. This is exactly what the next stage is. Start doing small iterations. This is a little cycle. It begins by saying, just do something. Pick an idea, an idea for a little trial. Do it. Stop. Take a little time for reflection. Do a retrospective. Look what works. Where were you successful? Build on that. And what you want to always concentrate on are little tiny baby steps. And now repeat. This cycle has a name in psychology that we didn't discover until after Fearless Change was published. It's called the Kolb Learning Cycle. It is how we learn. It's how we learned as babies. We are walking around today because we did exactly that. We stood up, we took a step, we fell down, we looked around and we said, that didn't work so well, maybe I should try something else. And then we experimented with another baby step. That's how we learn to walk, that's how we learn to talk. All language is learned that way. In fact, all adult learning is in that cold learning cycle over and over and over. And in the process, find other evangelists. Let them start experimenting until what you have is an organization full of experiments. That was the goal of my talk two days ago. That's the goal of fearless change. Organizational change comes about because you've got a complex adaptive system, and the only way to move forward is little tiny baby steps, lots of little experiments, over and over and over. It never ends. You never stop. Organizations, individuals, countries. We heard a wonderful opening keynote about a change in a government. It's exactly the same. All change happens this way. Even if you want to call it a revolution, I'm not sure that it was. 
Organizations are complex adaptive systems, and the only way to change them is to do something small and then watch. And on the basis of what you learn, move forward. And if you have that attitude, then there is no such thing as failure. There's only learning. And if you'll remember what I said two days ago, it's small, simple, fast, and frugal, over and over. Some point, maybe you'll reach a tipping point, and now you'll have an emergent behavior that will move the organization faster in a given direction, but you don't know if that will happen, and you certainly don't know when it will happen. Myth number two. Oh, my. I've just told you you're not rational. Now I'm telling you, goodness does not win. This is a bad way to start the day, isn't it? Goodness does not triumph. As an evangelist, you believe. As a follower of God, we believe. And somehow we fall into the trap of thinking because God is good, because our ideas are good, we know it. We believe in it, but that should be enough. Can't other people see how good this idea is? Why isn't that enough that the idea is a good one? It's a bias that we have, a cognitive bias. We heard a wonderful talk yesterday on cognitive biases. This is just one. It's called the just world fallacy. We want to believe that goodness will win. Well, I'm sorry. Think of times in history when bad ideas won. I live in the United States. We had an election a year and a half ago. Doesn't look so good to me. So it doesn't always happen. Goodness sometimes has to take a seat in the back. I'd have to wait a while to repair that damage. So you can't count on goodness. And you're going to think that this is a strange pattern. It has to do with the power of food. It's one of my favorite patterns. And here's one of my favorite experiments. It has to do with feeding people. So in this experiment, there was a control group. That's the group that just got the presentation or the, in, in the treatment. And then the other group got the same treatment or presentation, but was also lucky enough to get some nice food. Now, this experiment has been replicated many times, so it's been validated. Perhaps the presentation was about making a vote for a particular issue, or adopting a new practice. It could have been anything. But in trying to convince the two groups of people, we did exactly the same thing, with the only difference being, that's why we hope to measure the effect, the only difference being that one group got food and the other group did not. So in the final analysis, when we look to see which group adopted or voted for or moved in the direction we wanted, which group was more likely to do that? What do you think? <laughs> no, it was the group that got the food. Now here's the really interesting part of that experiment. I mentioned that it's been repeated, it's been done many, many times. Sometimes the idea is a bad one. It's not something that works to the advantage of the people who are hearing about it. Maybe it means increasing taxes or raising some restrictions. It's not something that they should be in favor of. But nonetheless, when you feed them, they support it. 
So it's not about the goodness of the idea. It's about the goodness of the the food. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Because there have been versions of the experiment where the food was something they didn't like, something healthy. And in that case, they vote against it. So it better be good food. That's what we care about. Not the goodness of the idea, but the goodness of the food. I see you had a question. Can I ask you to hang on to it unless this is a vital thing? Okay, can just hang on a minute. So it's one of my favorite patterns, and I recommend it in almost any situation. If you want to talk to a group of people about your idea, bring in some cookies or whatever it is. It should be something they like, something they appreciate. It's powerful. I gave this talk once in London, and somebody sent me this little picture of a cake. And they say, in our office, we follow Maria's rule. Maria's rule states, there are very few problems that cake cannot solve. So if you're having some struggles, call Maria, and she will bake this very nice cake, and you will all enjoy the cake, and everything will work out well. I'm not sure I would go that far with it, but apparently it works for them, and at least it's a step in the right direction. This is a hardwired thing. Even though in the United States we struggle with childhood obesity, that power of food, what we believe from our Stone Age ancestors is sharing food meant I trust you. You must be a part of my family or my close associates. If we share food together, in fact, in French, the word is compagnon. Someone with whom I break bread is my friend. And we still have that. It's very deep and very powerful. Myth number three. If I had enough power, If only I were the president or the CEO, I could just tell people, look, people, we are going to be agile by next June. Do it. Make it happen. Well, that's a myth. And in writing Fearless Change, we learned, because we believed it too, remember these are myths we subscribe to, we heard from presidents and CEOs who said, this is not true. I have tried it, and it doesn't work. We do know that if you threaten people and you say, we will kill you, or we will fire you if you don't line up and do this, yes, they will do it. But what you'll get is the appearance of being agile, or being Catholic, or being Muslim, or if you line people up, you'll get the appearance of that compliance. If their lives are on the line, if their jobs are on the line, yes, people will give the appearance of doing it, but as soon as your back is turned, as soon as nobody's really watching, and they'll go back to doing exactly what they did before. You're just going to drive that behavior underground. And now you have to bring in some kind of process police. And they have to watch everybody. And they have to check everybody. And they have to make sure, are they really doing Agile? We want this checkbox. Check, 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 check. Enormous overhead, and it only increases where your goal should be not compliance, but commitment. You want people to do it because they believe in it themselves. You, as the evangelist, want, as your goal, people to share that belief. And they do it because they think it's important, not because they have to or they must line up or they're going to be killed or 
Stephen Covey is one of my favorite authors. We lost him a couple of years ago. He passed away. He said you can buy a person's hand, but you can't buy his heart. His heart is where his enthusiasm, his loyalty is. You can buy his back, but you can't buy his brain. That's where his creativity is, his ingenuity, his resourcefulness. You can't say, look, people, be creative. we got two weeks. Get on it. It doesn't work. So I don't know how many of you have read The Habits, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. So you know I love real books, and I try to give a lot of them away. So this one is going to be on the stairway right here, and maybe somebody will come pick it up. It's India, after all. The pattern is personal touch. When you go out as an evangelist and you want to talk to people about your idea, in the back of your head should be some way of answering this question. Everybody wants to know, why should I do this? Why should I go agile? Or why should I look at these design patterns? What's in it for me? Again, a quote from Jeff Patton. Data is not going to help you here. It's empathy. You have to get inside. How are others thinking about this? Most of the time they're a little afraid. You have to address that. And everyone is different. You have probably seen this before. It's from the work of E.M. Rogers. But I don't think we use it correctly. What E.M. Rogers noticed in his research was that in a population of people, you're going to get different responses to any new idea. Some people are going to say, yay, this is a new cool thing, sign me up. Those are the innovators. But oh my goodness, not too many. In a normal population, a very small percentage, 2.5% in a normal population, and I have never seen a normal population vote. And then the other group, you know, this sounds like an interesting idea, but I would like to learn more. Maybe you could give me a book to read about it. How about a paper on agile development? Help me out. I want to understand it. The early adopters. But again, not very many, 13.5%. Even if we put them together, the early adopters and the innovators, we don't have a big chunk of the population. And then the next big group is the early majority. They don't move until they see everybody around them, people they know, people who are just like them, until those people are doing it. You can buy all the chocolate chip cookies you want, and they're not going to budge. And then it gets worse. The late majority... All right, I have to, if I have to, mm, I guess. And then finally, the laggards, they'll never move. They will always find a way. Always find a way to avoid coming on board with it. So your job as an evangelist is, don't worry about the people who are not enthusiastic. Focus your attention on the people who are listening, the innovators and the early adopters. And what we know is that most of the people that you work with are smart. Most of the people you work with want to do a good job. And if they begin to see that others are excited about it and they're having success with it, they will come to you and they will want to know, what's this all about? Is there some way I could be involved in it? And we know that this is the initial response, only that people will move up over time. So work on the people who are open and who are responsive and bring in the others gradually. Now, it's a myth. I have heard this so many times, so I'm going to say this is an overarching myth about Agile, that we are all going to do Agile in the same way. To that, I say, nonsense. You're never going to do anything in the same way. Because this is always in place. 
I don't care if it's agile development or TDD or whatever. Some people are going to be very enthusiastic and they're always going to be leading. And some people are going to be resistant and they're always going to be dragging their feet. And they're going to be slower to adopt and that's just the way it is. You have to live with that. Don't draw a line and say, let's fire everybody. If they don't immediately get on board, if they won't pair a program, they're out the door. If they have a contribution to make, then work with where they are and realize that this is what your organization will look like all the time. And you should foster it. Those people who want to lead, the innovators and the early adopters, let them go ahead. Let them lead the experiments. Let them try out things, and on the basis of what they learn, they can help bring the others on board. But those others, those late majority and lagger, they are always going to be behind. It's not always going to be the same people. People play different roles or different innovations. But this curve will always hold, and it's a myth that you're ever going to be marching together. So don't embrace frustration by saying, what's wrong with these people? Why can't we all get on board with this? It's just not going to happen. Sorry. Those are roles, not people. Sometimes you might be an innovator. Sometimes you might be a late majority. There is a correlation. Older people tend to be at the bottom of the curve. Newer, younger, not only people, but also organizations are more innovative. That's just the way it is. People can move around within that curve. And you can imagine why this is truth. Let's go back 10,000 years. And we're living in a little tribe on the savanna in Africa. And we notice some new berries, some new plants that we hadn't seen before. And someone says, wow, look at this new stuff. We should all go try those new berries. What would happen if we all said, okay, let's all go eat those berries? Huh? Well, it could be good. On the other hand, it could be bad. Wouldn't it be better if we say, hey, uh, you guys go try it. And we'll watch. And we'll see how it goes for you. And, and you, you young guys who are, are healthier and faster, and, and, and you let us know how those berries are. And maybe... Maybe we see how it goes. It looks like it's going to be okay. Maybe we'll try it later. Can you see the benefit for survival? If not, everybody wants to jump on the latest and the greatest thing. And so why that's deeply hardwired in us? Not everybody should run after the latest and the greatest thing. What if we were all innovators? We probably wouldn't have survived. So it's a good thing. Embrace it and work with it. Which leads us to the next myth. Those people who are so negative, those nasty skeptics and cynics. Bad people, obviously. We should just be ignoring them. Or pay attention to those people. The pattern is called fearless. Don't run away from that. What you want to do is learn from them. A lot of times the people who are the cynical people, the skeptical people, usually those older people, it's, uh, there's a reason for it. They are skeptical for some reason. Find out what it is. Learn from that. Listen to those people. Not with the idea of arguing. That's another talk, actually. I gave that one last year. Not with the idea of arguing. Fearless is about listening with intent to learn. In fact, that's what Stephen Covey recommends. Seek first to understand. If you understand where they're coming from, you'll learn a lot. 
before you worry about implanting your innovation or your new idea into someone who is resistant. Listen. Listen first. Champion skeptic is a valuable role for people who are a little resistant, for people who think, I'm not sure whether I should get on board with this idea or not. Embrace that person and role and respect what they have to say because every team, every meeting should have somebody who's not sure whether the idea on the table is a good one or not. We have so many examples of group think where a lot of very smart people made a very bad decision because nobody was willing to raise a hand and say, I'm not sure. Can you help me understand? Was this really the right thing to do? How about, and we'll raise a question, something we should have thought of, a consideration that we hadn't considered because we were all so enthusiastic and we were all so on board with this, we just missed it. Devil's Advocate, Edward de Bono, wrote a wonderful book called Six Thinking Hats, and he said, somebody should wear the black hat. Somebody should say, wait a minute. Is this where we really want to go? And have a little footnote. This is not about just keeping that cynical person busy. It's about listening. It's about learning. And you know a strange thing happens when you respect and pay attention and listen to people? They become a little more open too and they say, you know, I've been learning about this new idea. Maybe, maybe I could try it. It works both ways, that respect thing. Magic. Myth number five. You're smart. We already decided that. We took a little poll. So why should you ask for help from anybody else? Because after all, this is your idea. You know, if I bring in too many people to help me, well then I won't win that innovator of the year. Or that bonus. No, no, that would be bad. This is my idea. I own it. Beware. The pattern is called ask for help. And it's not only influential, but on so many levels it works because when you ask for help, you're offering a little piece of the idea to someone else. And as soon as you do that, then they own it. They're in. They get it. And once they've taken that little step, they're more likely to continue. Asking help or others is the absolute best way to influence them. And when you do, to appreciate them, the greatest gift you can give anyone is to say thank you for what you did. I really appreciate it. When we wrote this pattern, we thought, do we need to write a pattern that says, hey, don't forget to say thank you to people? And when we got reviews back, we realized, yeah, I guess we do. Because so many people say they worked overtime and they solved a big problem and they were able to make the customer happy and nobody, not the team lead, not the scrum master, not anybody said, thanks for that. Thank you. So we thought we need to, we need to put that pattern in there. And then we found some research. There's actually some research around giving thanks. It should be on time and sincere. Say what you mean. Don't just get up in front and say, team, thank you. Thank you, team, for all your contributions. No, no. It's what did you do? What was the contribution? What did you do to help the team? And then the impact. Because you worked on that bug, because you helped us solve that database problem, we can now do that customer demo. Thank you. There's research around people who do this all the time. They're called grateful people. They're always thanking others, appreciating others. Look at these wonderful benefits. 
What's not on here, the one that really appealed to me, was you live longer. So I'm on board for that one. I'll show you how it works. You know, you could have gone to any other session today, or you could have been out walking around this beautiful place. But you decided you'd come in and share 45 minutes with me, and that means a lot to look out and see all these nice faces and people paying attention as though I had something to say. I really appreciate that. Thank you.